Welcome to A Regenerative Future. I'm your host, Matt Powers. This is a podcast and YouTube show where we talk about our regenerative future and what's possible today, what we can do today in our own lives, and what people are doing with businesses, what people are doing with nonprofits, what people are doing on the large scale to regenerate our world and put people systems in alignment with our regenerative world. Today we're talking to Jaguar Randy. He is a student of mine. He is working on his advanced permaculture design certification, his a advanced PDC as part of the advanced permaculture student online. So he's made designs. Now he's, now he's making this community food forest, but it's part of his greater goals to bring back the Jaguar, to provide place for the Jaguar so that the Jaguar habitat can remain can remain intact. And it, that's, that's where his heart is. He fell in love with it. We'll hear about it in the story, his whole story, but it's really incredible. I feel really privileged and honored to have him as my student. And it's so wonderful now to have him here on the podcast to share his story with you all. So basically what happened though, was that when I got done with not, get, not getting the funding for that, that was a, a pretty good blow. I knew I didn't have the resources myself, but I, but I got a couple different articles done about it and different things, but mostly local. And it didn't, it didn't get the energy it needed to, to fund. So I was a little bit broken, but a lot motivated to figure out how I was going to make a difference because I already had, um, you know, homesteading knowledge, some, some permaculture knowledge. Um, I'd already done watershed management groups, landscape restoration, uh, landscape water harvesting, um, worked with Brad Lancaster, did stuff with um, uh, Bill Zedeik and um, like a whole group of like six, six of, the, of the big heavies in that group I got to work Rocking. with. So, so this stuff was all in, the, in my head, right? So I needed to be able to use these things. And I was doing some work with the uh, Arizona Trail Association as an outdoor guide, taking kids out for, um, you know, inter usually, usually city kids, taking them out for hikes and stuff and getting them um, acquainted with nature. And it's a, it's a stewardship program. So you take out a group multiple times, mm -hmm. usually attached to either science classes or math classes, and you're doing some of their homework uh, from class while out on trail and stuff and, and tying the two together. Uh -huh. um, and so we are doing that kind of work. And my boss from that job was a good friend of mine who I'd worked with guiding in the Copper Canyon and stuff in, in before. And so he, um, and he told me about a trip he was taking to a Jaguar reserve down in Mexico to go mountain biking. And uh, he kind of was baiting me to get me to ask if I could go, I think at that point already. And I immediately did, of course, because of course I was wanting to go mountain biking on a Jaguar reserve in Mexico. And so I wound up going down there and the trip was for the, the basically the director of the, of the Jaguar reserves uh, nonprofit the project that carry, that runs that Jaguar Reserve, their director had broken her femur a year before and was wanting to mountain bike all the way out to the reserve and back to prove that she was healed and back so people could quit trying to pick things up for her and do everything for her all the time. Uh -huh. And I think she was still broken. She was done with being broken. She'd spent months in, in, you know, in, bed, in bed after that femur break and stuff. So she was, needed to declare that she was back. So that's what the trip was about. And it was um, four of us that went out to the Jaguar Reserve. And by the end of a week-long trip, I was being basically offered the gig and um, my answer was, well, if I can, I have to. So yes, I will. Um, so the next day, we get back from that at like Sunday at midnight from our trip. And uh, the next day, by 9 o'clock, 9.30, I get a phone call asking if I can have lunch with a couple of the board members. I had lunch with a couple of the board members. And by the end of that conversation, it was, um, so we need to figure out how much you need to get paid and write a job description. That was how that conversation ended. So um, but it was a done deal. And so I spent three and a half years managing this Jaguar reserve and trying to do restoration work and that kind of stuff on the ranches around it um, in order to, you know, with, with people who are already in a program with that Jaguar reserve, they've got some really awesome programs. It's called Northern Jaguar Project, if anybody wants to check out their information for the Jaguar reserve itself. Um, so we were doing restoration work, but ranchers weren't excluding their, cow, their cows from those areas. So we'd do rock work and then the cows would trample any chance of anything regrowing, nothing would get to seed. So there would, there would never be a sign of what it did other than gather some dirt and, and reduce erosion. That was, that was obvious to people, but that was it. So ranchers are literally like, stack your rocks over there where they're not gonna bug us and we won't trip over them. You know, like there's not an appreciation for the work in the, in the area. And um, so the need for a demonstration site became obvious to be able to teach those things. And the county and the Jaguar Reserve were talking about doing one um, and I was looking for land, and whenever I found the land, it turned out both of them thought the other one was going to pay for it. So I paid for the land. 
Um, and then I had a couple of deaths in my family and really needed to fully motivate on what I thought was the most effect I could have on my life. Yeah. The biggest impact. Yeah. So um, I quit the Jaguar Reserve job, which was very hard to do, and uh, started a nonprofit, which is La Tierra del Caguar. And that's um, to focus on working with people on restoration techniques, um, on natural building, on all of these things in order to help the human that's putting the Jaguar in danger. Because basically in these areas, there's not the, the sale of Jaguar parts or any of that kind of stuff going on. It's, it's competition with cattle. It's, it's the fact that the land is so degraded by overgrazing for so many years that, um, which isn't on purpose either. Like what happened is that everybody moved to the town, to the towns and got modernized. And so this extended family that lived on and off of the ranch almost completely all now have individual houses, individual cars, individual cell phones, and that land is still trying to provide for that. So there's no way it could, it was already overgrazed. So now the overgrazing is, is exponential and the need for restoration work and for other opportunities such as food forests and all these different things to be implemented in order to create other economic opportunities. So it's a, a, a lot about regenerative communities is what I'm trying to create through ecotourism, natural building, permaculture techniques, restoration techniques, you know, all of it stacks up. And um, I, that's one of the things I've really loved about your set of courses is the fact that you bring those things together um, at least, you know, the, all the ones that are under permaculture and, and um, you definitely bring in the components of um, the systemic, um, you know, moving cattle around. My brain's missing the word right this minute, but, but you know, management. Um, management and all those different things that you bring to the table. And that's part of the reason that I was so drawn to your course. And I'm not sure how I got the information. I got, I got the download that I, that I did incorporate all those things and all the different teachers. But as soon as I realized that, that how much it was inclusive and how much you worked with these people and actually brought them together to, at the table and have modified how they think about these systems and stuff like that is the approach and the need that we have to do for everything that we're doing you know like that's that's what we're trying i'm trying to do too so your textbooks are ideal for the things that we're trying to do to move forward in this world because seeing those things as separate categories and not seeing that they completely interrelate is not only short-sighted but it creates these factions that almost they, they have to naysay the other one because it, it doesn't fit their paradigm you know, like, like people, people that are into holistic management don't, don't like permaculture. They don't like the word even, you know? And so you've got all these different things going on. And I don't, not, not every individual is going to agree with that. But, you know, as, a, as, as these things, just like everything, people try to divide themselves and be in this, like, isolated thought process. And that isn't going to move us forward into the regenerative world that we need and the regenerative economies that are the only way we're going to get there. Um, that can only happen through melding all of these different techniques and acknowledging that they offer so much to each other no matter which one your system is most based on being aware of the other systems. And when you see something that's, that's, this isn't going to work exactly like system, knowing how to implement the, the ones that, that are around it is, is key, you know, because yeah, they are all I'm, one. I'm actually tempted to do that Joe Rogan thing where you have like different experts and have a panel and like have a live discussion between, you know, leaders of these camps, because it's fascinating when you talk to the actual authors or the innovators behind these techniques or ideas, they're not like, religious about their own creation they're like oh that's what i thought then but you know what i've been recently and it's like they're always curious and innovating and pushing mm -hmm. and and because they're not trying to be called gurus they're trying to actually work work this field and work it forward you know and i think it's the format and maybe you know the the format of the internet um or maybe the lecture format i don't know but for me i i consciously work to make things lateral because if we get to the point where we're like no i understand this um, we can miss a lot. Um, and that's kind of like the story of science and our story with our relationship with nature, like assuming that we understand it. And I was mm -hmm. thinking about um, a documentary I recently watched about farmers in, in Bhutan and how they're in that same situation where they're getting drawn away by modernity, drawn away from the family farm. You have less and less people working the farm um, or, or, or the same people working with less time. And so I wonder if there's a similarity with there, and I wonder if you could help us understand um, what's going on in the thinking uh, and, and, and where might this head? Because it, 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 it seems like everyone's leaving the country, leaving the farm and going to the city for work. And that's happening all over the earth. And, but you were saying that they need the land to get the cell phone, to get the car. Um, so that sounded a little bit different. Is it a little bit different? In, in, there's both going on, um, but what you, what you often have is, used to be the extended family, and this is true, I think, pretty much globally, that used to be the extended family lived on the ranch. The oldest son usually got to inherit that ranch, but the other ones had their, still lived there and did that work and were part of that thing. 
you know, but now more and more, all the rest of that, of those members of that family are going away to work um, to either the big city or in, in our case, there are a lot across the border. Um, so we definitely, we've actually got a bunch of interviews with people down there. And one of the things that a lot of them um, are saying is that it, we could definitely help stem that happening by creating more opportunities in those communities. Um, and one of the things that is really important. So the things we're gonna, we're gonna be trying to work on are teaching a lot of these different systems through our um, demonstration site, also um, artisanal things, but everything with, a, with, a, with an attempt to be regenerative, not just, not just sustainable. Because I always say sustainable still leads to stain. You know, it's, it's right there in the word. And, it, and it's, it's we're, we're too far gone for sustainable to be good enough. Right. Um, and I, I know I'm preaching to the choir here with you, but you know, as far as like trying to explain what we're, where we're going with the things we're doing. So artisanal things and stuff like that that fit into that, like doing things with driftwood, doing things with you know different items like the, the clay that we can that we can grab right out of the ground right doing those kinds of things and i've got a sculpture background as well so that um you know i'm, I'm able to, to do a lot of that i've got a building i've got a lot of different things like it's been a very interesting walk for sure yeah yeah um, i love it the layers of yeah. Yeah. Uh, but um the key here is we're going to be teaching these systems through the demonstration site but our idea is to teach repl replicable collectives because if you teach someone how to grow something new but you don't teach them how to take it to market and you don't give them that path to market you're not necessarily helping all that much, right? Especially if it's something nobody else in the community eats currently, right? So one of the ideas that I have is, and this is a great one for people to steal, I would love everyone to steal this idea, um, food truck, farmer's market. Mm -hmm. All like, you know, yeah. food truck in the front, farmer's market in the back, same vehicle, right? Like you pack it full of the stuff that you're, that you, you're sampling, things that are ripe right now, so people know how to cook with what you're selling in your farmer's market, right? Um, yeah. And in that community, it's a really rural community, so I also, I, I used to do some art stuff with uh, the like elder, elder elderly ladies, like day center where they go hang out, I would go there and help paint and sculpt and stuff like that with them. Um, I've also painted murals in that community and stuff like that. So, so the community knows me pretty well. So I'm going to get those ladies to try the different veggies and stuff that I'm, that I'm growing that, aren't, that people aren't used to there and get them to cook with them and do a competition for a recipe book. So that they're them, it's, it's local ladies creating these new recipes, competing with each other to do it. And then the ones that win for each, each month will get put into that recipe book calendar thing at the end of the, at the, end of the year. You know, so that way I get people to buy in to trying these things that they're not used to, to trying. You know, and I can do a competition with the restaurants in the same kind of way for who does the best dish with this product that I get them, right? Um, so these are ideas for how to get your stuff out there that people aren't used to. But I also have the advantage that we're working to help save the Jaguar because that's what brought me down there, right, was working to, to save the Jaguar. And so that's the only way I see to do that is by helping the people and healing the land. Mm -hmm. And so that's the work we're doing is, is saving the Jaguar by healing the land and helping the people. So that's... Um, so. In order to do that, we've got that, that gives us that marketing side too, right? Like when we create a bacanora, which a bacanora is a different type of a distilled agave. So it's like a tequila, but it's from Sonora only from the region that we're in, and it's with a different agave. Um, so we'll be able to create those and, you know, have uh, Jaguar labels on bacanora bottles. Um, salsas that have a growl in every bite, you know, with the Jaguar on the label and have those all be marketed through collectives for that product that's based in the nonprofit. So the collective will be separate from the nonprofit. They will create and sell the products. The nonprofit is for education. The collectives will sell the product. And so by doing that, I'm teaching replicable collectives for these different things. So somebody from a different area that's trying to protect the turtle or just wants to modify how things are done in their community can come learn a system and take it home and, and start to implement it. And if the community or the, or the reserve or whatever it may be wants to send multiple people to learn multiple skills and multiple crafts, come over, learn them, and go back and implement those. So we'll be doing the, the production and facilities and that kind of stuff. We don't have a large piece of land. It's um, currently around 25 acres, um, about probably seven of that, seven to 10 of that, not, not quite 10, probably seven of that being um, river bottom farmland and the rest being rocky hill um, that is much more like the Tucson area here. So I've got those two things combined. I'm right along the side of the river. Um, the well is, the, the, I just got the well cleaned out. The water's 11 feet down in the well on a hand dug, you know, round circle well. So we've got plenty of water. Um, and, but we'll be teaching a lot of dry land techniques as well. So we'll have areas that are irrigated and areas that are done through dry land techniques and stuff. And I think you're really gonna love our um, design for the property and stuff whenever I, whenever I uh, get a bunch of that information to you. But yeah. since we're looking on the tourism and that stuff, there's, there's layers to what the property needs to do. And I also don't, I don't think everything always needs to be ugly. Mm. You know, like you don't have your, your aquaponics tanks don't have to be big, ugly plastic things that people see, like with a bunch of plug plumbing that they see, you know? Yeah. So what I've got designed is um, the water getting pumped to the top of the hill and then uh, overflowing into a little waterfall um, swimming pool 
natural swimming pool and then into a creek, which is my irrigation canal. Mm. So the creek is actually higher on the land by a little bit, and it's already been delineated. Um, the land company that wanted this to happen because the river swell, swelled at one point and left rocks and gravel on the high point. And so my high line through from where the spot looks like it should be a waterfall, the clearing in the trees against the cliff of the, of the rock face, where that's already there, the mm -hmm. sand and gravel kind of emerges from that and comes over and around right over towards the well area. So it's already kind of drawn for me. It's already kind of raised for me. It's already got gravel and rock laid there for me. The trees wow. have naturally started to grow in because I've had the land now for a couple of years. So cows have only been grazing there whenever they break through the fence and, and come in and graze. So a lot of trees are self-established along that line because there's already water there. So um, any water that, that oversees, oversees our system will be going right back into that same aquifer there because it's pretty shallow where I'm at. So, um, so it was already drawn for me, you know, like I'm walking the land and it's telling me that it wants this. And now the trees have sprung up all along that same spot. Like the other areas that are open grass right now, mostly Bermuda, um, don't have the trees and stuff in them. They, they're all in this like sandy spot through the middle that, that is most likely where the water vein travels through. There's At the other end of that is where a second well is on, on a side property that I also purchased. So. Um, there's we've got we've got the water there and all that kind of stuff so those trees are self-established and they're gonna grow in and they're mostly you know where we're at most of your trees are, are, are legumes so we automatically have the wanting to feed our fruit trees and stuff along those areas you know so it's it's, it's an automatic win-win in that way there so the um the land like i said it told me where it was on that irrigation system that i can do with you know the the geomembrane stuff that holds water i can only think of the spanish names for it in the colegio membrana but i can't think of the english name but i'm um, just you know the plastic yeah, the plastic tank kind of stuff that they use, you know, like that you would use for a line of uh, that pond liner stuff. Like I'll, I'll be able to use just strips of that from the company that sells those tanks um, and use those to line that and then cover it all in rocks and, and gravel and everything and have it look like a natural spring, a natural stream through the through the land. But it'll feed a couple aquaponics lakes that are, that'll be there and the evaporation will much reduce because they're sunk into the ground much more and they'll be tree, tree shaded, which helps feed the fish and, you know, and all the different layers of that. So there's there's these beautiful layers going on there. In that part of the system and and so i wound up finding this land while the jaguar reserve i keep going off on tangents and coming back to the main the main line of the story you know but i think that's how life kind of happens right yeah. um so i was looking for this land and they both thought the other was going to pay for it so i created the, the i bought the land created the nonprofit, and we're now working to implement that demonstration site so um another thing i managed to do is i got a hold of uh 276 225 watt solar panels so it was a whole, the community food banks, um, all of their parking array was all of these solar panels. And they were complete, they're doing a complete remodel of the place and re-leveling and all kinds of things. So those were all getting ripped out before they were anywhere near their, their time. So I was able to get all those for a song. And so now I have that to be able to know that I've got all the power I need. Mm -hmm. So currently there's somebody building a structure down on the land to be able to put all that solar panels up. Um, and I had to be realistic there because even if you have the skills, sometimes you doing the work isn't where your highest value is going to be. You know, so I had, I had to hire a crew to build that because I'm doing other things that are, that are more important to the project right now. Um, but that's going to give us something to build our classroom under. So underneath that, we'll be doing a earth bag structure that will be, um, it'll, it'll be, to begin with, we'll use it as our cabin, but it'll be our, it'll end up being classroom. So whenever, you know, other stuff comes up, we'll have it available. Um, and then outdoor kitchens and outdoor bathrooms that can be used for camping, for the farm, for everything, all, you know, composting toilets. So we're in the process of all that getting built out right now. Um, and the current push that we're doing is, is for fundraising, um, for um, fencing and stuff for the actual areas that we want to be able to farm, to be able to, to be able to put more of a farm fence in those areas. Because currently the fencing that's around is barbed wire to keep the cows out. So that's the, the next big stage is I need the fencing and I need some irrigation stuff. I've got the money already for the pump and um, the tank. So it's, it's literally the lines and that stuff. But, you know, once you're, once you're dealing with large pieces of land, that stuff is a lot of money once you start actually wanting to get it done. So that's the current wave of funding. And we're not looking to get... Um, well, we're looking to get as much as we can, but we're not, um, our, our current goal is we've got a, a $5,000 um, matching setup going. So we're looking to get that whole 5,000 plus the other five that the match would, would end up being. So we're trying to get 10,000 together right now um, to be able to do all that thing and all of that, because that's, you know, the next stage to be able to know that we can move forward is to be able to fence those areas off and start doing the restoration work. And we're going to start terracing the, the hillside and doing a lot of, like, I don't want to do very heavy terracing. It's pretty steep and it's, um, basically rhyolitic it's volcanic volcanic ash um kind of stuff so it's it's you know look, it looks a lot like a conglomerate like concrete kind of stuff with bigger rocks in it and then the, the and then there's a big bunch of 
big river rock all over the place too that's great for building with and stuff but it's uh, not great for planting in you know so it's going to be a hard spot to do a lot of digging and that kind of stuff in on the upper land the farmland it doesn't have any of that in it so um, up on that upper land i'm planning on knocking down in 2011 we had a big freeze that went all the way through this whole region in february killed a lot of saguaros and stuff up here in tucson but down there killed a few different things including a plant called a boat thorn acacia it makes a really interesting beautiful like little kayak looking thorn on the on the on the bush um, and uh the whole bunch of those died all over the place and so they're they're all again they're they're a legume they're an acacia so they're so i'm going to chop a bunch of those and drop them and then pile rocks on them to create a really light terracing that will then you know start to get filled in and, and i will you know i'll kick the dirt and rocks that are loose on top of that to start it um to start it collecting um but not I'm, I'm not planning on spending a lot of energy doing that work and then there'll be a few um more or less key line terraces that are where we're going to be building a lot of the cabins and stuff in uh, there i've got this neat little amphitheater area that in the, in the hillside so the, the highway is right next to us but it's on the high ground mm -hmm. and then you've got the mesa for that we've got land on and then we've got the slope down into this neat amphitheater area and then you go down further to the far left huh. and so huh. that amphitheater area has some great spots to be able to do some terracing or um, like hobbit cabins to sit back into and um also get a good amount of agave work done in those areas and prickly pear and a lot of those kinds of um native product uh, chilter bean is, a, is a, you know the 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 mother of all peppers or the father of all peppers or however you want to phrase that is the chilter bean pepper which is a little tiny red pepper when i was about three or four years old my cousins down in mexico handed me a handful and told me they were candy and i popped them and they're extremely uh potent little tiny chili peppers and so that's yeah, how i got to them yeah. yeah they're beautiful little chili peppers though but those are those go native all over down there so um they're, they're a high um value crop so We'll be doing a lot of work with those and prickly pears and agaves and prickly pear. You can make these awesome dehydrated um, snacks that are kind of like the, the consistency of like a funyun kind of thing, you know. So so they're like they're crispy and soft and light, and you can make that with prickly pear and you can yeah. flavor them. They, they really take flavor well, so huh. you can do whatever. It's, it's like a freeze dried system to to create those. That's fun. Um, yeah, and so there's these there's several products that are, that can be done on that hillside to teach people how to commercialize their areas that don't have the irrigation water capabilities. And we'll be able to do a good amount of food forestry because we do have that, that hillside and one part of it slopes in to a side lot, a side, a side plot that I've got right there that will end up. That's the, the idea for that plot is that it only gets watered at all for establishment. Um, hmm. And then I want it to completely handle itself off that hill and off whatever we can create in water catchments and stuff up on that hill. Um, one of the issues I'm having with creating a plan on this site is that there is these rock features that I don't know exactly how they behave at this point. So there's going to be some thermal mass ideas of where things are going to happen and then the machine is going to have to hit it and we're going to have to be like oh that doesn't go quite as deep as we thought it did there okay yeah. you know, so um you know there's always some adjustment in the plan but there's there's a good amount of areas that i'm not even tempted to try to document anytime soon because they're going to be longer term even though we may start implementing them sooner their results and expecting them to be a part of a, of a bigger pattern isn't in my current process so I'm thinking much more about certain parts of the land that we can develop out sooner and start to teach with. So that's why that area, that amphitheater area that I was talking about, terracing, it's got that's one of the areas that I think can be the most um, demonstrational because we already have to put the equipment in there in order to put cabins in. Mm -hmm. So that being the case, it's going to be a, a good spot to create that, um, to, to make that disturbance, you know, and, and have it be worthwhile to, to do a large disturbance and go ahead and plant it in and, and, and you know, make something happen with it and leave a lot of the other areas to continue to rewild, which I think has been doing wonderfully. I've mm -hmm. got drone footage from when I first, well, not from when I first got the land, but from early on when I got it and from now. And the difference in how the tree cover, the vegetative cover and all that kind of stuff is just incredible. It, it's really, it's, it's quite Just from keeping, the, keeping move, the cattle out, right? That's just from keeping the cattle keeping them out and then having them come back in occasionally. Um, and so, you know, basically like what we would call decent management of the cattle, right? Right. Because right. um, even the, the stuff that was just all weed and stuff has, has gone back to being more, uh, not the pasture I would love, but pasture. Again, instead of having all kinds of nasty weeds and all kinds of big dry spots and dead spots in it, it's come back in a very real way from the, from the, the most people there consider me wasting the, you know, like that's why like sometimes my fences accidentally get broken. Um, you know, and, uh, and the cattle all get in. And so you end up with, uh, you know, like a whole bunch of cows in all of a sudden and it's, and they were like, well, this is going to waste, you know, because nobody down there, you can't get wood chips. You can't get anything that was cut from a field that was, that, that you would consider mulch or any of that kind of stuff down there because it all just gets burned. Yeah. Everything just goes away right away. And so you end up with these severely depleted lands and it's, and it's this vicious cycle. 
and then people are like, well, why is my land dead? And it's like, well, you, you killed it. <laughs> you know, like, I don't mean to be mean, but you killed it. And so we have to change how we're doing things. But I figured out through time that it has to be done by example in that area because it's really easy for people to just be like, well, that won't work here. And I think that's true for a lot of areas. So I think, you know, the more and more per permaculture sites and, you know, all these different techniques, um, locations that are utilizing all these different techniques start to open up and allow people to come into them and, and, and learn more about them, the better, you know, and, and not just when they're paying to, you know, not just for PDCs. Like it needs to, we need more sites that are set up as demonstration sites regionally. Um, it'd be really awesome to be able to get, funding or agencies or whatever to, to agree and, and take part in that to where it's like, well, where's your, where's your county demonstration site at? Go well, there and there's all your information. Yeah. You know, I mean, we're at the point now where they are taking all the high schools in our local area and breaking them down into one and there's not enough rooms and, and there's wow. not classrooms, there's not enough chairs, there's not enough teachers, but they don't care because there's no funding. And so, mm -hmm. um, I mean, some places are defunding the police because they literally don't have the money because yeah and the, but the thing is is that the money's there it's just where it's been been allocated right and right well, sort of, sort of. on a larger scale but what about what about california and new york city because the the, the top one percent makes 50 to 40 percent of the tax revenue happen for their state and they've left and so we're in this weird situation i'm going somewhere with this um it relates mm -hmm. um but we painted ourselves into a corner and environmentally we that's kind of where we're coming from with permaculture with these uh, these preservations and everything and but it's, but, but it's crazy because we have to walk so deep into our, our culture and society and our systems because they're so broken. We have to walk all the way into the economy. And we not only have to walk all the way into the economy, we got to walk all the way down to where we can only do baby steps because the local economy, they're so broke, they can only do small, cheaper things. And so it is that, 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 that food, that, that side garden, that you know, thing, that food truck, that small entrepreneurial business because no one in that local economy has more than a little bit of money to break off mm -hmm. and use. And then once we get that circular economy, that those little bits that get broken off, they stay circulating and don't leave. Because I mean, everything is so extractive with the business models that we have today. The entrepreneur, local business, because there's such atrophied muscles that bringing it back, modeling it as you are, bringing it back down to products that can be consumed by locals, which means that they're, that they're not gonna cost very much, is, is exactly, I believe, what needs to happen. And I think it's a best practice that we could pick up and use everywhere. And I think like America needs to adopt that immediately. Um, there are, if you, I don't know if you've traveled, you know, across the US in the past 10 years, it, there are stretches where you're just like, th these are all ghost towns. These are ghost towns. And, mm -hmm. and then you think about like- the, it's the same thing we were talking about. Yeah, and so we are in a very precarious position and it's projects like yours that have a holistic understanding and focus and, and the ability to tie those things all together in the service, in the solution that are needed everywhere. And I mean, mm -hmm. I jokingly, James today was talking about how he has his, his genre of music's like ska and punk combined. And I was like, skunk. And I was like, and then you should donate all your proceeds to save the skunk. And it's like, and it's like, no, no, we actually need people everywhere. I was like joking, but it's like, we need people everywhere to be the advocates for the local species. Today, this morning, I also saw someone talking about possums in my permaculture beginners group and about how it's like, we need to think about these animals in our yards. We're cleaning everything up. We're taking all the biomass out. We're like making everything look straight lines and, you know, there's no habitat. And so what looks wasteful to the eye, what looks, you know, inefficient or looks cheap or, you know what I mean? There's so many things that are hangups and preconceived prejudices that are given to us by these broken, just utterly broken societal paradigms and, and, and norms that have nothing to do with what we need to do to get forward. And so I really hope that your project gets that funding. I really hope that your project catches fire and the model starts being adopted by the locals. And then they start innovating their own thing. And then you're like, huh, that's even better. You know what I mean? And it creates it's this- It's really moving down there. Like we've got, we've got multiple, like the counties there, um, there's the, the county there's a county just north of us and a county just sort just south of us that are um, the county seats are right there within 20 minutes each direction huh. of the land yeah. and, um, and the, the mayors of both of those places um are bought in on the project they're they're like civil engineers and that kind of stuff are bought in on the project like the communities the community knows the what we're trying to do and i've been working at it for years now i've got um, four and a half five years now of working down there in that community and like i said i i painted murals in public myself there and stuff so 
you know, the people literally know who I am and why I'm there and that I'm trying to, you know, help the community. I've worked with kids groups and, and the elderly and all kinds of different stuff. So like there's any, anybody who, who like asks can get a, can get a story right away about community engagement. Yeah. So um, by having that foundation, I know that we can have the impact that I'm talking about having. So um, by creating this demonstration site and having cabins for ecotourism, um, you know, people being able to do mountain biking, hiking, kayaking in the area, all that kind of stuff out of there too. So, so if we don't have a workshop that's got all of the cabins booked, then there's the ability to rent for other um, activities in the area and stuff and bring in truly ecotourism that's going to want to see clean nature and, and see things taken care of and, and want to go birding along the river to all these kinds of things. And so, um, and, and it's an interesting thing because part of the reason I was saying that we need to try to get the communities involved is because I'm, I'm, I'm here in Tucson and I know that I do know all about Brad Lancaster's work here, uh, but it's a really great thing that his curb cuts were illegal when he started doing them and now they're county policy. Like now when the city redoes a road, it, it, they build in meetings for curb cuts that are absorption areas instead of have, trying to, our, our streets have always been our um, canal system here. And so you end up like people will kayak down our streets during the monsoon rains. We didn't get any monsoon rains this year, but uh, whenever we had them, um, so, you know, that um, they, they've started creating these curb cuts themselves and creating these whole islands down um, traffic, down high traffic streets and stuff to create water infiltration using the techniques that Brad taught them after they came to try to cause problems for him because it was illegal what he was doing. So now those have been taken on as policy around here. So um, the, to, to make those changes is there, but you have to lead by example, even if there's a chance you might get a shit for it, you know? So um, I think that that's a powerful thing uh, to, to realize too is, is you start creating these changes and then people start to see them and the ripple effect is much bigger than any of us can ever know. Um, the, the number of people who were affected by something and the number of people that you were aware were affected by it aren't the same at all. You know, it's, it's, it's so much more impactful than we realize uh, whenever we create, you know, real changes and put them out to the community. That's the other thing is if you're making a bunch of things happen, but nobody ever sees them and you never, you never show your, your research and your work to anyone, then it can't create that growth and that ripple effect. And, um, so I think that's one of the critical things is to, to make these changes happen and, and implement all of these techniques. Um, and you know, for me at the demonstration side, it's much more about implementing more techniques than it is about how much production we end up with. The idea for me is that we're gonna create production for the season stuff, but I wanna buy from the neighbors and stuff who are taking on these techniques and create the economy for them through that production. Um, the production on site won't be huge amounts. We don't have, you know, we, we, we have enough land to do a lot with, and we will be doing a lot, I really want to feed the, the community. I really want to have, you know, the people who come out for workshops and come out to do things. I want them to have the best organic food they can possibly have grown right on that site, you know, and, and that's where a lot of that is going to go to is to doing those kinds of things and promotion um, and, you know, getting other people interested in it by having little festivals and little things like that, because um, that community involvement and doing all of those things all under the name of the Jaguar make it to where it starts to change those minds. Because the reality is when we want to change the world, we, we, we don't have to, like, this was one of the things whenever I was doing work with the Jaguar Reserve, so I was like, well, it's neat that we work with kids, but are there still going to be Jaguars when these kids inherit their ranches? You know, then, you know, the dads that are killing Jaguars aren't the dads that are like, oh, what'd you do in school today, son? Let me check it out. Let me, let me, look, at, let me look at your work you brought home so I can read about the Jaguar. They're not those dads. It's dad that's like, shut up, I'm drinking. Like, that's the one that's the problem in our world. You know, those are the people that we actually have to try to influence. And I think that's where... Um, those of us who do carry that, um, you know, male privilege and that male, you know, uh, size and all those things can influence those people by doing these things because it's, you know, they're a lot of the times they're sheeple. And so if they see like somebody they consider to be cool and somebody they consider to be, I don't know, whatever it may be, manly or whatever the word may be that, that, that makes them want to, you know, watch the tights run around after a, after a big skin, you know what I mean? Like whatever it is that, that does that component for people. Um, you know, you can help influence people that are the ones that are destroying our world by making these things a little bit more cool, by making them more presented to people, by making them visible in the public eye. And a lot of those people that, that are causing the problem right now are very much about the survivalist side of things, are very much about, like, being able to, you know, withstand, you know, and currently the word I believe people are using is civil war and all these different kinds of things. And so um, within that, like the, the ability to impact them with our techniques and with those things in a way that we never could have done through conservation, through trying to tell them to protect nature, um, we can do it through that method. And so that's one of the things that I see going forward with the label of the Jaguar in our, in our American work is more about 
um, getting the information out there and trying to change minds in those ways. And so that's, that's uh, we'll be teaching workshops and stuff up here, but that's, that's much more trying to focus it there because there's already great organizations here in Tucson doing all the different chapters of this work. Um, so I don't feel like I need to jump in and compete with them a whole bunch. They're doing great work. But I think one of the big things is how it does tie into conservation, how all of this ties into to helping nature. Because if you're doing, if you're rotating your cattle amongst multiple pastures, then those areas are available to wildlife while your cattle's not in them. You know, things can, things can, like the soil life, the, the bunnies, the this, the that, all kinds of things are able to live in those places. And so you're automatically increasing diversity. And when you're wanting more pollinators and you're wanting all those things, and if you're doing a good zone five buffer that's, that's designed to help take care of wildlife in order them to not want to get through your, 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 your main fences and all that kind of stuff, then you're benefiting nature with all these different things, you know? And if you're, if, if you're you know, creating a better water in, in your area and, and filtering those things and all the different processes that take place whenever we start to restore and we're not having as much runoff and we're not having all those things take place, you start to really create these relationships with nature that are the core of how I see us be able to actually make a difference in this world. Because people yeah. don't want to separate the part of the for nature and not have it be productive. Absolutely. You know, it's interesting, conservation. I think, like where we talk about how we've gone too far, I think that we, we are now in the point where we have to regenerate. Um, we, we really can't, like, just conserve things. we got to get our hands in there. And you know, um, you know, make it so that the water infiltrates, make it so that the water collects. Um, and California, I feel like, is in that position now where we've extracted so much, we've destroyed so much, um, we've m created this man-made drought um, that, that is so deep, and uh, mm -hmm. that we need to. The combination of. Yeah, I was just saying that um, it's so deep that we can't we can't expect to extract our way through it. We're like, all right, well. We'll set this up. We'll still make a profit, but we'll we'll make it nice. You know, it's like we really need to step into that. The, origi the origination of the conservation movement was to preserve the wild. It's like, well, now we need to regenerate the wild. And so I completely agree with that. And I think that's really a vital um, flip that needs to happen in so many conservation uh, agencies and organizations. And what's so cool about what you're talking about, um, I, I just noticed some of these like principles that are these awesome takeaways from what you were talking about, is how the, the actions are the things that people actually resonated with. It's not the words. It's like people, you know what I mean, go around and they, they talk the talk and that is meaningless to people. And it's the, especially when they're poor, especially, especially when they're in tough, a tough situation, they wanna see it, they wanna see it. And they wanna know that it's real, that it's really possible. And I think that that is the key for all of this is demonstrating what is possible. And then another incredible um, point that you brought up that I think is a best practice for everyone um, is giving back to the community. It's that people care aspect of permaculture that is so often just gets left on the wayside. Um, that those festivals you're talking about, they create these soft pressures. So it's like a hard pressure is it's like, you're not gonna be able to eat next week or you know, your, your wife's gonna leave you if you don't do this or something like that. It's like a hard pressure. This is a soft pressure where you're going to these events, people are recognizing that the community values the Jaguar, values these, these spaces. And then they're like, there's something here. I don't know what it is but I'm going to suspend my, my judgment. And that's the moment that the door is open and then th things can start to change. And I think that when we get, and <laughs> you're obviously not doing this, but I think that there's a little bit of a, um, like telling a neighbor what to do thing happening in certain places in America. And I think that if we brought that, you know what I mean, in permaculture to people, that would just be the end of it. Um, and it's this invitation. It's this showing that we really do care about the environment, about the biology, about you and our community. And it's- And, well, and that you can actually get some stuff, more right? out of it, you yeah. know, because like you can, you can get multiple, you know, in, income streams um, out of doing it regeneratively instead of having only one. And you, you know, you're, as we know, you end up with land that can provide for more cattle. And so you end up with more cattle on a system where you're moving them around usually than you would have had if they were open to one big pasture. And so um, I don't necessarily agree with like the, the pack them as thick as you can concept, but, uh, but you know, there is a, there is a good ratio there that, that works well. Um, so once people see these different systems and they see, you know, my horse is standing in shoulder high grass, um, they'll be able to like, and, and they know that they don't have grass at that part of the season, then that creates what, what they're doing. I want to do what they're doing instead of you have to change what you're doing. Just like you're saying, if you, if you approach it from that direction, Nobody wants to do it. And that's kind of what bringing in experts is because you've got this person from somewhere else who's telling you that you're doing it wrong and you're doing it the way it's been done for generations there. So it can't be wrong. Yeah. You know, in your, in your mindset, there's no way that could be wrong because that's the way everybody's always done it. 
So it's it's not about telling people what's wrong. It's about showing people what's right. Yeah. You know, and that's where that difference comes in, like you're saying, of having the demonstration site and working with best practices and having that be somewhere that people can see it. So we're, like I said, we're right by the highway. But luckily, all our all our, all our main services that we're using are, are lower than that. So the sound, um, you know, the sound sphere is much friendlier because, it, because the sound goes over us overall. But it's um, being right there along the highway makes it to where people can stop in and see what's going on. And um, I've got, I found uh, one of the, when I asked the cowboys out on the reserve, um, about people doing the dry stacked rock walls like they do all over the mountainsides that yeah. are all over the area of Mexico. Um, the, the cowboys for the reserve uh, all individually at different times, different ones of them use the same answer to me. So it's their standard answer. Anybody who worked that hard died, but they would have done it for you for beans is how they phrase that. <laughs> so um, I found somebody who hasn't died yet who does that kind of work in the area. And so I've, I've got him hired on to, to do some dry stacked walls towards the entrance area to, to, to reinforce the fences, but also to kind of beautify and, and make us findable when you come up to the area. And then, uh, so he's going to be doing them and teaching his 14-year-old grandson to do them while he's there. So the, the, handoff, the handoff is taking place, and I'm able to help facilitate it. Um, and, of course, I'll be learning the skill from him, too, while he's doing this. But it's uh, having that be something that can be carried out is really important to me, too, because as a kid, my family, my, mom, my mom's family is from the mountains of Chihuahua, so that's where she was born. And I, Spanish was my first language because you have to talk to your mom first, you know, and she didn't really speak English until I went to elementary school. And she started learning English with us. And so my dad didn't really learn Spanish, so they just they had a great relationship. They communicated what was needed and, and didn't get into very many arguments, so it worked really well. The not being able to communicate so much, it was a different time, too, than it is now, of course. But um, they, uh, so I grew up traveling the, the, the back highways of Chihuahua a lot and seeing these straight, beautiful, dry-stacked rock walls that travel for miles into the countryside out there, just along ridges and all these different places, and it's just so beautiful. Mm -hmm. And uh, wanting to carry that out and have those traditions stay alive and be, you know, something that is cherished and that people realize that there's value to that, you know, because people are like, oh, it's cheaper to do it this way and quicker. So it's like, that's right. It's cheaper. Cheaper is not always, that, that word does not always have good connotations, you know? So, right. um, so that's part of, the, of, of the, the, the fun is trying to find those people who still do things in the traditional ways there and um, make sure that they're cherished for what they know and that they know that that's appreciated and then help them to be able to hand those skills down to people who are interested in them. Um, I just recently started learning a little bit. I've done a lot of different artistic venues, so I started or, or modes, and so I just recently started playing a little bit with leather work because it's really popular in the area there. It's one of the things that teenage boys will consider cool enough to learn if you had an art uh, workshop for them, huh. and then you've got an open door for them to get into a lot of the other things. So I've, I bought some tools to, for use from a friend and his whole kit because he said he's never going to do that again. And I'm like, well, that's sad that you feel that way, but sure, I'll take them. <laughs> so um, I'm gonna, that's, a, that's a new skill that I'm, I don't need to perfect it. I need to be able to teach a beginner's class and get them to be better than me by the end of that class. Like, that's, the, that's how good I need to get at it, you know? Um, and the sculpture side of things, it's, it's a lot of it I already know. Like, it's just the, the individual, what's different about that, you know? It's kind of like you picking up a different, a different musical instrument. It'd be a lot easier than someone like myself who I've always said I can barely play a tape. You know? like, <laughs> yeah. Woo! I've not heard that one before. Wow. <laughs> So yeah, you know, I have a high appreciation for people who have dedicated their time to that. I, I was playing with clay while other people were learning to drum instruments. You know? and so it's different people working with different skill sets, right? And yeah. It takes them all to really improve this world. So I'm glad everybody doesn't do the same things. It'd be so boring. Oh, yeah. And I'm so glad and so grateful that your unique path has led you to this project because it's, it's a really, it's something that, when it happens in the full, it's not going to end. You know what I mean? It's going to be something that becomes like, like grandfathered in. It's going to be something that you know, the roots that go deeper just become stronger. And it's going to be something that is a seed, the story of it, the example of it, the, you know, the metrics of it, all of it is going to be a seed for neighboring communities, for international communities all over the world. And I'm just so grateful that you were here to share it with us so that we all could know what you're doing, what we can do, how we can help you. And, and actually speaking of that, um, what, what's the website that folks can go to check more about this? So um, the, I've got the, the two different ways to get to the website. Uh, the, the easy one for people to, um, who don't speak Spanish to write down and utilize is gonna be landofthejaguar.org. Um, but the name of the project and the Facebook page are La Tierra del Jaguar. Mm -hmm. The land of the jaguar, literally, same same word. So Tierra, La Tierra del Jaguar would be the, the other pronunciation of that. Dot org. Uh, if you accidentally type in dot com, it'll it'll redirect you there too. We've got we've got all those set up so that they all go to it. It's, That's awesome. Um, if, if someone's accidentally trying to donate us money, we definitely don't want them to have trouble getting there. Um, and we'll be doing a 
fundraising campaign um, through the end of the year to work on um, getting ready for spring is what we're is what we're going to be calling that. And so that's about getting that irrigation line and that fencing and those things so that we can put those in. And uh, there'll also be some heavy equipment time in that funding to be able to get things ready to be able to start to plant in the spring. Awesome. Um, so we've got the structure, we've got the well, we've got all those things are all going. Um, right now, it's really about being, beginning to develop the demonstration side side of things. Um, we're already got the things we need for the classroom to be built. So that's the next big phase. And once, you know, all of these things need to be developed and then live in for a while to be able to really demonstrate what they do, right? Like a food forest isn't all that impressive whenever it's recently planted. It's, it's, it's kind of like, oh, how cute, you know? But um, after some time, those things start to really teach what they know. Yeah. You know, they'll be teaching us as we're, as we're developing them. And then over time, we're going to want you and your students to come down and take workshops, teach workshops um, in various things. There's going to be a whole lot of fun stuff to be able to come down and either learn or teach or engage in, in uh, within within the programs of La Tierra del Cahuac. I love it. So, yeah. My wife, well, my wife wants much. us all to come back to Mexico. She wants us all to be back in Mexico. She was there t two years ago uh, down in the Guadalajara area. So she, oh, wonderful. Yeah, her heart. Uh, my brother in law did his mission there. My in law did their missions there. A lot of love, a lot of love for Mexico. Yeah, and I, I took my, um, I drove from the Jaguar Reserve all the way down to Guanajuato mm. to take my PDC. And I had been down in those areas before as a kid, but that's where, but that's where I took my PDC because I wanted to be, um, I wanted to have the best terminology and all that kind of stuff for doing stuff down in Mexico. Yeah. You know, um, but then I wanted, uh, it, it, I don't know that it was a, 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 my certificate isn't a true PDC certificate. You know, oh. it's, it's, what it's, it, he's not in the lineage or however that works. So, um, so, um, so that's part of the reason for this one. But the main thing that, that I, that I wanted from your courses is the advanced part and the way that you really do bring in all of the different techniques and stuff. And I, I want to thank you and congratulate you for that. Again, the, the, the outlook of coming into this as an educator and seeing all of this information as, tools that you implement to get the job done yeah. is very, because so many people are so ingrained in their own thought processes and their own knowledge that they bring to the table that seeing the value of the other ones is difficult. So that's one of the big things that you bring to the table with this is the fact that you meld all those so well and do it from the point of view of an educator so that it's well placed, well like delivered. You know, it's, it's, it's so much different than any of the other stuff that I've, that I've been, that I've taken in, you know, and it's completeness. And there's a lot of the information that I've already done the courses with some of the people on and, and those kinds of things. And I still will go through the whole thing because the value added by your take on it and by the fact that you didn't just talk to one person about their point of view on it really does make that a, a level above anything else that's out there. And I look forward to being able to use your materials. And I don't know if anybody's translating to Spanish yet, but if not, I hope that it's a, uh, correct enough for our region and stuff. So, I, so if, I, if that's something that needs to happen, then um, however I can be involved in helping it to, to move forward, I'd be down to because it's uh, having that as a resource and the way you're doing it, I think trying to brand something ourselves or anything like that without acknowledging that the information came from you would be uh, would be a lie at this point because the, the, the reality is, is that you've got the most complete stuff out there. So that's what I want to keep by is the most complete information out there. So we'll, we'll figure out that. I know you've got the affiliates programs and those different things that people can do. And I'll be engaging in all of that to a very high level. I, I, I really plan on us being able to do a lot of things together. I, I see your openness to that. And again, that's that's a big draw and a big thing that I see. That's, that's why about the water tanks, I was right away, I was like, you're in, like, let's, let's dance. You know, because um, that is the big component that even for our nonprofit that we're missing is that knowing how to engage those influencers, knowing how to do all of those things. And, um, and that's really not an easy thing to even teach. Hmm. You know, it's, it's, uh, I think part of I, that is that I, you, I, I have a secret. Mm -hmm. And so I share it every once in a while and I'll share it today. You have to ask a question only they can answer. And literally when they know that they are the one that has the answer to that question and no one else has that answer, there's a magnetic force. If, and if they're educators, it's ir irresistible. Like if you're a teacher at heart, you want to answer the question and there's like, it just pulls you in. So ask a question, and this is how I ended up being pen pals with Noam Chomsky, how I got in contact with Lawrence Lessig, um, and, and this was all like before anyone knew who I was. I was like young, young when I started writing Chomsky because I, I was living in New York City during the 9-11, the whole thing. And so I just wanted answers. And if you ask, and this is when I learned this, if you ask a question only they can answer, they know it and they're compelled. So I would say reach out to people that are critical, that you know can help you, and you know care. And so when you reach out and you ask, you're keying right into their modality. And so their like curiosity is peaked. Their, their identity is peaked. 
Um, and then if, if, if you're asking for help, um, their compassion is piqued. So I would say, ask a question only they in all the world can answer and you will get an answer. Okay, that sounds powerful. I really <laughs> like that advice. That's neat, I like that a lot. Um, and you know, one of the things that I think was a hurdle for us, and, and this may be true for other people who are trying to get projects off the ground, is I think that in the nonprofit community and, and in that stuff, one thing is, is as a nonprofit, you have to be established for three years before most foundations or anyone will recognize you at all. Mm -hmm. So it's completely word of mouth and what you can create. Nonprofits were originally designed basically so rich industrialist wives who felt bad that the kids of their husbands under the, you know the kids of their husbands employees didn't have shoes would set up programs to like send you know they're usually like original nonprofits were often taking care of problems in communities but it was okay. often that person trying to somewhat whitewash the the damage being done by that industry in the areas mm. in whatever way it was like that was a big part of it so most nonprofits were started by people who had money and so you call together a dinner of a bunch of your friends and each of them get, does a hundred dollar plate and you funded this project. Yeah. Exactly. Right. Nowadays, many more things are coming from the populace. Like even the path that you've been able to take through being able to do Kickstarter and all those things and, and be able to being able to offer uh, the, the kids option and as a way to get things moving. And, and that, that made it much more amenable to, to a lot of people to talk to you because it was an area that wasn't dealt with and the people saw a vacuum, you know, but the ability to, to go through that process and do it would have been so much more difficult in the old years of academia without being in that rich structure, you know? Um, and so the internet has opened that up a lot for us, but I think that in the nonprofit world, there's this lag. Um, if I've got a product and I can market that product through Kickstarter, it being a book or whatever it is, there's that tangibility yeah. for people. And so we've evolved that to work, but for the nonprofit side of things, for people to, to take a nonprofit um, seriously, so to speak, is, is kind of difficult in the beginning. And so that's been, one of the things that I had one person tell me who um, they didn't tell me directly. They told a, a, an older lady that I know that was, that was at a talk I did. They were like, Oh, he just wants us. He just wants us to fund his farm. He just wants us to pay for him to have what he needs. And it was like, okay. So when I saw that, that changed my focus a little bit to making sure that I handled everything I would need to be able to live on the farm, right. which is the state I'm at now. Like I've got the funding in, in hand and the work's being done to get my need part done. Yeah. And so from here, what I'm able to start, fundraising for and what everything is for now is to be able to create a demonstration site and do the teaching. And so now it's that part that is more altruistic. Yeah. You know, so, so, so I've, I've eliminated that line of it, which I think is going to be valuable to being able to move forward because it's not like we have to do this, we have to do that. It's like the demonstration site needs these things to be able to, to start teaching. Right. Um, so I think that's an important thing for other people who are starting projects and trying to get funding and that kind of stuff to, to think about is to, to mention that you've got what you need. Yeah. You know, make sure first off that you do have what you need. <laughs> you have some way of being able to get to those people who have that money because if they if they in any way think that, that you're just trying to set yourself up, it's a totally different energy um, for it. So I, I think that's just a little bit of advice for anybody who's trying to get something going and needs outside income for it is to, you know, if, it, if the, the, the product or the goal needs to be what you're talking about and what you're what you're funding for. If you're if you're needing your basic needs then that's a different GoFundMe altogether, you know, like that's a, that's <laughs> right. And so I think that that's a, a line that, that I just recently was able to cross mm. and be able to get that stuff handled um, just by basically by getting all that solar panels that I was talking about earlier. So now that was over a third of the financial money that I needed to do the project with was for solar to be able to power everything because I didn't want to have a power line coming in and, and telling people how to live off grid, you know, so, <laughs> right. so it was important to, to walk the walk. And so, but now that we've gotten, you know, I, I for the whole project, if I use 100 panels, that's a whole lot of panels for the kind of work we're going to be doing. So um, I've got you know 176 panels that I'm able to, to now liquidate and and be able to fund the project, uh, our part of the project off of, and know that you know my cabin's covered, my stuff's covered. So um, and all the power's covered for the whole project. So that's what I mean. Like now, the fundraising that we're doing can be is focused towards what we need to be able to make the demonstration site work. Not right. what we need for the paper. So um, yeah, so water, yeah, know, power. I mean, you've really gotten all the components together um, for this site. Um, and I think a lot of people do get stuck on water and power. <laughs> so it's, it's awesome that you're there. Elements. Yeah. yeah, and having those two parts handled is just incredible. And I got really lucky with this piece of land I found. Um, upriver, there's a uh, big reservoir and dam, um, upriver firmly, which is south, is upriver in this case. And um, so it's always letting out water. And it's like an hour and a half on a beautiful little country road, um, like country highway to get back to that reservoir. And then um, the water comes to us, and less than less than a mile 
um, up downstream from me is a diversion dam that pushes all the water into irrigation canals, and that part of the river is really level. So that diversion dam is basically always filling my aquifer because it's it's slowing down the water there, and the other one's pouring in at the top part. So I wound up with an extremely ideal little piece of land to know that we've got water for the longevity. But you know, the, the biggest works that we're going to be doing is going to be the dry land farming stuff and that kind of stuff. But that stuff takes longer to establish. It takes more work to get it going and stuff than the other than the other parts of it. So we'll be doing a lot of the market garden style of stuff in, in some spots to get things moving and to start showing people how to be able to start creating some income and some, you know, growing their own crops for, for themselves and their, and their extended families and stuff to begin with at least. And then the food forest and that stuff will start evol evolving from there. So, you know, you've got to have this sequence in your head on how you're going to evolve out a property. And sometimes those things change, you know, because originally the thought was that, um, the classroom space and stuff would be in a, in a different spot than it's getting built now. But since the solar was the first thing we wound up with, then that changed the order of things because now we have this component. So that's one of those key things in the plan too, is to, is to program in uh, the ability to change gears and, and, and figure out, okay, so this is what's happening now. You know, like, no, we've got, we've got a tractor for three weeks. Like we can, we can do all this earthwork right now. You know, right. like I, I know how to do earthworks right now, but we've got the tractor, so you're going to do it. You know, and being able to evolve the plan in those ways is the only way to really instigate the plan with, uh, without, the bucket loads of money that, that's the other option right of just like we're going to pour money on the problem and hope it fixes it and it seldom does because you're usually missing the observation and all those things right you know the, the land evolving over time and the project evolving over a little bit longer time frame is usually more beneficial in the long term i don't know how long we're allowed to go on for here man. I know i'm <laughs> loving this but i guess you're going to edit the parts that, that, that fit together in the end right yeah well i'll add at the beginning um but i think it's good i think this was great i really appreciate you coming on here and sharing with us and I hope that folks go and click on your link, check out your work, learn from your work, support your work, and you reach that next level, that next stage, because it's obvious that when you get to that point, you're gonna be able to iterate and expand and keep going and help more and more people. That's definitely the goal, Matt. We're trying to, to spread this you know, information and huge tool in being able to move that forward. So I wanna thank you again for that. And, um, I want to continue to evolve this process with you. And so uh, we'll, be, we'll be along for the ride. Awesome. awesome. Thank you so much, Randy. That was awesome. Thank you so much for listening to Randy. His links are below. You can donate to his, his nonprofit organization that's doing all this. You can learn more about his work. You can see his work down in the links below. Thank you so much, Randy, for joining us. That was awesome. In my world right now, I'm preparing for the holidays, but I'm also preparing for our future. And our future is not just like our future, like you and I, but, but it's our regenerative future. And it's a conference that I created uh, over a year ago while just coming back from MycoFest. Um, William Padilla Brown brought me out to go to that and I just was so enthusiastic and they inspired me and I wrote this whole curriculum for this weekend event. We were going to do it at Camp Singing Wind and then the pandemic happened and canceled it all. It was sponsored by Fungi Perfecti, Paul Stamets company and it was going to just be this like weekend retreat with all organic food. I had this like dream. And then this happened, but I'm really kind of really happy with what happened because I put it on the shelf. I worked on the regenerative soil book and I, I really just put my time just I'll focus on that. And then I came back to it and I just, I guess this is the time for it because I have triple the amount of speakers that I had before and, and they're incredible like levels of experience, breadth of experience. And our future is a conference for regenerative businesses and entrepreneurs and anyone who's interested in knowing what our future is going to be like and how we can fast track it. Because if we can provide the services and have the services be solution based, then while we shift our economy and fund solutions, we get better resources and better outputs. So we get better food, we get ethical energy, we get cleaner water and cleaner air. We get, we get back our like local economy and we get back our the relationships of our community. And it, it's all based around 
entrepreneurs, startups, regenerative businesses, bringing it back home, giving people the tools to do it themselves. So I, I wrote an entire curriculum. I have an entire ebook, and, and it's a workbook that I'm going to be printing out for, for membership signups, but it's free. So everyone that wants to write a business plan or refine a business plan or take their business plan through the steps of a regenerative business plan, this is the process to do it. I'm giving it away free. It's part of this event and it's a free event. There's going to be live Q&A with regenerative market gardeners and farmers and for myco biz, for hemp and cannabis biz. There's going to be also like small group like almost like a mastermind q a like discussion lateral sessions where people are really you know getting their ideas out discussing them with other people working on them too having these questions in the workbook to work through and write down their ideas as they're having these really rich discussions networking with people and and then getting to hear from such amazing speakers as jean martin fortier the best-selling author and market gardener Paul Stamets, founder of Fungi Perfecti, the, the amazing, incredible author. We have Joy Beckerman. We have Jean Rulak, the executive producer for Kiss the Ground, which many of you probably just saw. We have Antoinette Marquez, the founder and incredible mind behind Amacy Beauty. We have I, I'm just so many people, Dr. Elaine Ingham. We have Dr. Alicia Spalding, who treats her patients with food and medicine from the garden. We, a practicing doctor, right? Who also has a nonprofit organization where she, you know, uh, creates gardens for schools and helps people get access to medicine. And we are blessed. I, I could go, there's 30 of them. So there's Rishi Strauss, there's William uh, Badia Brown, there's Deanna Denard of the Kiefery, there's Eric Olson, Frank Goldbeck, Trad Cotter. There's Ava Arvest, there's Cassandra Posey, there is Hannah Apricot Eckberg, there is so many people participating in this. It's a free event. There's a free workbook that is, is going to be transformative for the people who take it seriously and fill it out and follow along. I'm going to be the, I'm the host. And so I'll be leading you through all the processes as we go through this, as we learn together through this incredible event. And, you know, something that I really wanted to like change was I didn't want the event to be um, held by like the, the, the bandwidth issue of all the live different variables. So in the afternoon when we have interactive and live Q&A and all that, it is, it is all going to be, you know, live but everything else is going to be released that day. All the videos are going to be seamless. All the videos that are, are going to be pre-prepared for you so that you'll have the ability to watch this without a hiccup. And all, all the people that we're doing all this stuff with are filming it, and it's not gonna be through Zoom. Even so, you know, Paul and I may talk through the Zoom and everything, he's gonna be videoed. So this is going to be really high quality, no you know hiccups or bumps and we've got plenty of space so your meals so you know your beginning and end of the day we're not going to eat up a huge amount of your schedule it's spread out so you can fit this in throughout the week and they're there once the videos are released for that day they're there and we're going to have extra days at the end of this process so you can catch up on any videos you missed so you can go through the complete process get all the videos in no hiccups on service, you get access, and, 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 and you get all the information, no, no, no static, no, no. We want everyone to be able to go through this process, to launch a business, to be able to create a new form of income for them in, in these hard times that helps people, that helps the environment, that starts a new story, that brings a depth and a layer of hope to so much of, uh, of our days to, to that just changes the rhythm that, that, that shifts things because that's what we all need. We need that hope. We need that, that joy to come back because it's been, it's been a hard 2020 
and and we have solutions. We've seen we've seen such such tough things happen because we have systems that aren't designed regeneratively. But we can. We can be the change. We've got the tools. We've got the incredible array of speakers from all walks of life, all contexts, all climates who are going to help us shape that future. So get the guidance you need. Hear the stories of the people who have done it. Get the advice from people who have done it. Go through, go through the, you know, the work. Do the work with us. Talk about the work that you did. Refine that work. Get to that next level together. Let's, let's, let's you know, speed this up. Let's jump this up to another level. Let's do this together because it's possible. Whatever you want to do, even if it's a vague idea, let's refine it. Let's get into it. Let's look at all the different array of businesses and options and people who have really done it. Let's talk to them. So this is going to be an incredible event. I hope that you join us and I hope that you share it with your friends, your family. Spread the hope, the, the joy that we can heal this world. We can make a living doing the right thing. We can be the change in our local communities and bring really for the first time regenerative thinking to many of these places and bring hope at a, such a holistic level that, you know, you just shift everything. That's what we're talking about here. We've got incredible speakers like Sean Sherman, best-selling author of The Sous Chef. We've got folks who are experts in their craft, people who are sharing and spreading it. We've got people who um, have, have taken products and launched them, people who train other companies to launch products. We've got people who've got decades of experience doing this and who have launched companies that are worth millions of dollars. So join us. It is possible. And our future is so important because there's no one but us who's going to do it. We are the change. We are the ones. So now it's up to us to step up and make it happen. And the beautiful thing is it's beautiful. And it's gonna be fun. And we're gonna and we, we gotta do some hard work, no doubt, but we're gonna do it together. We're gonna start on the path together. So join us at our future January 14th to 18th now. I had to add an extra day because some people said yes. And I've had such an overwhelming wave of excitement around this because folks want to share how they did it because they want you to be successful. They want to see this model, this regenerative economy, this regenerative future become reality. I'm Matt Powers. Grow abundantly, learn daily, and live regeneratively, and I'll see you soon, okay? <laughs>